Hi everyone, this is Vicki Steves, your Librarian for Research Data Management and Data Science Subject Specialist here at NYU's Division of Libraries. In this video, I'm going to go over from start to finish how to use Git and GitHub to collaborate and at the end, how to link GitHub with Kaggle so that you can do all your code work in GitHub while still uh, seeing all your results in Kaggle. So the first thing I wanted to go over when discussing Git and GitHub are the terms. So Git and GitHub are not the same thing. They're not made by the same people. In fact, one of the chief architects of Git was really reluctant to use GitHub for a long time. Um, so very different and they're very different products as well. So Git is an open source revision control system that was made in about 2005. So there were revision control systems that came before Git and some that have emerged after. Um, but Git is definitely the one that you will see the most of. It's definitely the most widely used. Uh, so we'll go over it today. GitHub, by contrast, is a website where you upload a copy of a Git repository. So you can use Git anywhere, on a server, on your local computer. Um, I guess those are your choices, which is pretty much anywhere. <laughs> Whereas with GitHub, uh, you just use that through the platform. So GitHub is the place to store your Git repository and Git is the tool that actually does all the ver version control and that uh, will work on your local computer. So we like to use Git for collaboration for a few different reasons. Like A, we care about version control. So managing who's changing what in our project when. So we want to see different versions of our files over time. Like if we accidentally break something, we wanna make sure we can go back in time to a point where things aren't broken. Um, so Git can help facilitate that. The other great thing about Git is that it doesn't let you overwrite someone's work without explicitly saying, yes, I'm overwriting this. So when many people uh, collaborate, like in the same, for instance, Google Doc, you might find people overwriting each other all the time. With Git, you have to explicitly say, yes, I'm overwriting it. And it goes into the log for the version control. And so you can always keep track of who's doing what and you make sure you don't overwrite uh, and mess up and conflict each other's work. So these are sort of the main reasons why we like to use Git for version control. And I thought I'd go over a little bit about like what Git can do, what it can't do and how it works. A Git repository on your local computer will contain a snapshot of your file and references to those snapshots, which are called heads. So uh, this will help you like if you wanna go back three commits in the past, you need the head to be able to do that and it will restore the snapshot of those files at that time. So uh, Git works best with plain text formats. So things like CSV, .py, .json. It can version Jupyter Notebooks uh, to, to some degrees of success. The, when you try and look at the differences between the versions of two different note, of two of the same notebooks at different points in time, that it can get a little funny. Um, but it does, it, it can do some version control with that. Um, so the good rule of thumb is anything that can be opened in like notepad or text wrangler or sublime text like those are, it's a good indicator that it can then be version controlled with Git. Um, Git can't really version binaries like Microsoft Word documents like the docx um, or PDFs is another example, although both of those files can be stored in a Git repository you just won't be able to like do differences and, and things like that. So when you're working with Git, the first thing to know is that Git works on branches, which represents the independent line of development. So for every snapshot of the files that Git is keeping, it's linked to the parent snapshot that it's built on. So by default, everyone's repositories uh, will be on the main branch. This is also called a trunk and other version control systems because you know the branches come from it. Um, GitHub calls this default branch main, Git calls it master, so I'm going to show you how to configure Git so that you're in sync with GitHub. Uh, so all the terminology lines up, things like that. So, but first let's just examine sort of the, once you are on a branch and doing your work, the three states that your uh, files will be in. And this is really important for understanding how Git works and how to do version control. So the first state that your files can be in is just called the working directory or project folder. So you have some files there like normal, nothing's changed. Um, the changes aren't being tracked by anyone. They're just in there, you're just working on them. You move files to the staging area in Git so that Git knows that, hey, these changes could potentially result in a new version being created. So if you change your CSV, you put it in the staging area and then the next we'll see you commit it to the repository. That's how you tell Git, 
the staging area. These are the things going into the repository next. Git has a staging area and other version control systems don't. And the reason that Git has one is to give you more control over what is added to the repository. So for instance, you might add just the CSV file and not the R file because you're still working on the R file. You don't want to put in the staging area yet. Uh, so you can do it down to almost a line of code as well. So then once things are in the staging area, the only thing you have to do next is commit to your changes and put them in the repository, which tells Git that, hey, the new version, the new changes that I've made, these are the new version of these files in this Git repository. So as you go through the stages of just general work, your files will likely go through this cycle many, many, many times. So when you're working on your local computer, all you will be doing is staging area repository, staging area repository, staging area repository. So it's a good workflow to understand uh, as we move through. So again, it's cyclical. You will move through them all the time. So we mentioned GitHub as the place for you to upload a copy of your Git repository. I will say there are other places like GitLab, Bitbucket, SourceForge, and others. Um, you're free to use those. However, uh, I will say that the data science community is very active on GitHub, um, which certainly affects uh, where people post their code. So uh, what I'm teaching you with GitHub is transferable to any of those other platforms I, meant, I mentioned. So you will have all the skills by the end of this video to be able to do this exact same workflow with any provider. Um, so I'll just say I'll just say that before we start. So the first thing to do when collaborating with Git and GitHub, I think, is to get a repository and add a collaborator. So of course we would then go to GitHub. All right. So here's GitHub after I've logged in. So if you don't see this, you probably have to log in first. Like these are all my. Uh, repositories here. Someone's requested my review on something, so I got a notification about that. So this is uh, what GitHub looks like. So to begin creating a collaborative repository in the top right hand corner, you just click new repository. You'll be brought to this template. So you can use others uh, as a template if you want. Uh, I don't have any. I don't want to use the Carpentries one because I'm not teaching a Carpentries lesson right now. So I'm just going to name my repository Hello World. And then to be able to just immediately download it, we should initialize it with a readme. I also think it's a good idea to add a git ignore, which is basically it ignores all the files uh, that you maybe don't want to get into git, like that doc mac underscore os file that seems to show up everywhere, like the dot idea folder if you're using a certain software or, you know, some of those minutia. So you can filter on the type of language. So we're going to be using Python. So I'm going to scroll, or I can search rather, all the way down for Python. And so it's automatically going to add a git ignore with the things that uh, GitHub sees being checked into repositories that maybe don't need to be there. I also think it's really important to choose a license. Uh, so again, like we saw for data, a license will tell you everything that you need to be able to work with a data set. The same thing goes for code. Now, these are a lot. <laughs> And uh, you might not know what all of these are. Thankfully, GitHub has a resource for us called choosealicense.com. You see, I go to it all the time. It's already there. They give you three options, but they also say, you know, I want more choices. And when you click that, they give you a nice table of each of the licenses. And if you hover over each of these conditions, permissions, et cetera, it tells you exactly what they mean. So I tend to use the MIT license for mine. So I'm just going to add a quick MIT license there. So now once I click create, this repository will be ready for me to add my collaborators and work on the materials that I want to work on. So when I click create, I'll be brought to basically a blank repository. You'll notice that here are all those files I asked GitHub to create for me. And the first thing I'm going to do is go and add my collaborator because this is a collaborative repository. So in the settings, I go to manage access and I'll be prompted for my password. So just log in with your password. After you do that, you can say like GitHub tells you, hey, this is, this is public, everyone can see it, but not everybody can push to it. So our collaborators will be people who have push access to our repository. So I'm just gonna add one of my colleagues in data services. Here he is, I know his uh, avatar. So when I add him to this repository, he will then have to go to his email and accept it. So for all of you working collaboratively on Teams, I suggest one person create a repository and then that person adds their collaborators. So you can keep adding more 
So if I wanted to add another colleague of mine, like Andrew Batista, who's our geospatial librarian, I can click that. I can add as many people as I want. And then once they accept, uh, I can give them different permissions. Like I might make them co-owners of the repository. Um, that's usually what I do if it's a equal collaboration. If there's somebody I have to manage, I might give them less permissions, but we're all equals on our datathon teams. So just give everyone co-ownership. Once I've done that, then I can start to download this repository and start my collaborative work. However, before that, it's usually a good idea to meet as a team. Like I said, you do want to have some period in your datathon where you're discussing what you want to do. And I would suggest that you organize yourself in your repository with issues. Now, GitHub issues are basically like a to-do list mixed with a discussion forum. And they are really, really useful in collaborations because you can assign yourself to one. Where we just say, as soon as you're ready to start working on an issue, assign, assign yourself to it so we all know what you're working on. So an example might be, make sure visualizations are accessible. So from there, we can add things we can check. Or it's like, I think, add your opinion. And you can add, see, there's a little checkbox feature. So I might say, make sure all the images have alt text. I might do like a rocket ship because I think it's a particularly important one. You can add emojis. You can add people. You can always click preview. And then you can check and uncheck after you submit the new issue. So add your preamble. Add your justification. Add what you want to do. Uh, you can add a label too if that helps. Like if you find a bug as you're going through the datathon, maybe you write a new issue or you can say like it's a good first issue. So if you want someone with maybe a little less programming experience to be able to work on this, you can you can label it that way. Or just say like, hey, this is an enhancement. We're going to enhance our visualizations by making them accessible. So you can add one of those. And then when you submit it, it will all show up as a list here. I can check this off or not as I'm working through my issue. And so I might say like, oh, I'm going to assign this to myself because I'm going to work on this. So as you're organizing in your group work, you first get, make a collaborative repository, add your collaborators to that repository on GitHub. And then I would brainstorm and add as many issues as you can think of for the work you want to do during the datathon. And then when you're ready to pick up that work, when you're ready to actually do it, go ahead and assign yourself that issue. It's useful too, because then you can filter on things like all the things assigned to me. It's everything right now, but for you, it might be only a subset of the total number of issues. Um, so you can do quite a lot with them and you can always filter on like is open. And then typically once you go through the pull request, which also later, the issues get closed. So at some point you're done working on something, then you close the issue. After, let's say I have my issue done, I have added my collaborators, we're ready to hit the road, start coding, start getting in there with our data. Then we switch to Git. So all of this has been in GitHub so far, and now it's time for us to bring it down to the terminal and work with Git. So the first thing you do is hit that big green code button. You'll notice there's lots of different things. I can download it, I can look at HTTPS or get the link via SSH or use GitHub's uh, command line interface. Click HTTPS. Do not download it as a zip file. So in HTTPS, click that clipboard icon, and then we're gonna bring up our terminal. Everyone will have to install Git, uh, but for Linux and Mac users, you have a terminal built in that you can use. So for Mac users in the spotlight search, just search terminal, click the first thing that comes up. For Linux users, uh, depends on your distribution, but it's usually called console or terminal, and you can search that and get it. For Windows users, you will need to search git bash specifically. So go ahead, search in your start menu, git bash, and pull it up. So this is my terminal. This is what it looks like for me. Yours might have a black background and white text. Uh, this is just like all aesthetic. I just prefer a white background with dark text um, for myself. So that if it looks different, don't worry. You wanna make sure you have a little dollar sign or something that's called a prompt. Sometimes you might lose that prompt. And if that happens, just click control D and you'll find it again. So whenever you enter a git command, just look for that dollar sign. First, I'm going to change directory into my downloads folder. That's just because this is gonna be temporary work for me. Um, and I put all my temporary things in my downloads folder. For you, it might work to have like a source folder where you have all your GitHub repositories on your computer or put them in my documents or somewhere easy for you to find. But for me, it's gonna be my downloads folder for now. Then to download the repository from GitHub to my local computer, I can type git clone 
and then I can paste in the link either with Control Shift V, or you can right click with your mouse and paste it into the terminal as well. I definitely wouldn't recommend writing this out because there's lots of opportunities for human error when that happens. So you'll notice that Git is just downloading the repository and now it will have created a folder on my computer called Hello World, which holds the repository. So if I CD change directory into Hello World and I list out the contents, you can see, oh, there's my license and my README. If I do ls-a to show me all the hidden files, you'll notice, oh, there's my git ignore. And oh, here's a dot git folder. This dot git folder holds all the version control for everything. Do not delete it. Don't mess with it. Don't do anything with it. I just want you to know it exists. So if you see it, you don't get confused, but please just do not um, interact with it. The dot git ignore is a hidden file. So in your file explorer, you might have to go to view hidden files to be able to see it and edit it, but you probably won't really have to do that. So just so you know, the hidden files, um, don't ever touch the .git folder, but this other stuff like the .git ignore, you can feel free to edit that as you want. The first thing we'll have to do when we're using Git is tell Git who we are. We can't do anything with Git without configuring it first. So uh, we are going to do that. Back in the day, people used to email each other Git repositories. And so the two things you absolutely need is your name and your email address. So let's do that now. In our terminal, we'll type git config dash dash global. And that dash dash global means whatever I'm about to tell you git, apply it to all my repositories. Don't apply it just to the one I'm about to download or whatever. Everything, that's what the global means. We'll do user.name and then put in your name. Don't put in Vicky Steves. There's another Vicky Steves. She's a lawyer in Canada. She can do that, but nobody else should. All right, nothing happens. That's good. No news is good news. Now that we've configured our username, let's configure our email. So we have to do git config dash dash global again, user.email, and then you should put the email associated with your GitHub account. This will help you verify commits. Uh, it's like a feature in GitHub's interface. So I will put in my NYU account because that happens to be the primary email on my account right now. For you, it might be your personal email. Um, so whatever one is currently associated with your GitHub account. And again, no news is good news. If nothing happens, that's good. And I have my dollar sign, so I know I'm still at my prompt. The other thing we have to do, I mentioned earlier that GitHub is now naming the default branch main, but Git is still calling it master. So we have to fix our local Git installation to match GitHub so that when we're pushing things to main, uh, Git, uh, Git knows what we're talking about. So this is another configuration you can do, git config dash dash global. Make sure there are no spaces between the dashes and global. That's a common error. Uh, you type in it dot default and then capital B branch all together and then you just type the word main. Again, nothing should happen. So this is good news. If we, we can double check all of this by saying git config dash dash list, you'll notice here's my username, here's my email, my default branch is main, and then I have this extra config about my core editor. You don't need that. Um, but, but it's nice to have. So now that I, we have our repository all ready to go, because we're working collaboratively, we are going to switch to a new branch. So I usually don't introduce branching this early into somebody's Git experience, um, but because we're working collaboratively, we can't have everybody pushing to the same branch at different times. We'll get so many merge conflicts that is like the worst. We want to use branches to avoid merge conflicts at all costs. And you'll find that this is actually a very common way of interacting with a Git repository when you're doing it collaboratively. So most people will work on a branch, make a pull request, things like that. So this is the workflow I'm about to show you. We are going to make a branch and a branch again is an independent line of development. So this can be something like my great new feature that I love or a bug fix. Eventually these branches will, well, it's very likely that someday these branches will be merged back into main. And the reason we're using branches again is to avoid those conflicts in our collaboration. We don't all want to push to the same branch and we don't want to have conflicting code. So let's make a new branch. We do that with the command git checkout dash B. So the dash B there is what will make a new branch. We also use git checkout for other things. So I'm going to make that point clear. 
and then just give it a short descriptive name data viz if i was gonna fix all of uh create some new data visualizations or data viz ally if i want to talk about my accessibility issue that i made before so when i hit enter something happened and that's good that is that we have switched to a new branch and when i use my favorite command to double check that get status it will tell me i'm on here nothing has changed so nothing's in the staging area everything is good we're all up to date and so now we're just ready to keep working we're ready to get going so i'll open our uh, repository now in just my file manager so here's my downloads hello world folder um since we only have these one folders i'm just going to edit this but you'll have the same workflow so you just work like normal so if you're working in jupyter notebooks you'd then maybe go to your terminal and start jupyter notebooks and start running a jupyter notebook um, so you, at this point, you work out of your folder that you downloaded, so out of the Git repository here, and then you can just add files like normal. So let's just say I make a change to this readme file. I say something like, hello world, and this is a markdown file, so I can use like one big hash to make it a heading. I can do two hashes for like a, a second heading, and I can save it. So I just like, am, I'm writing and saving like I would any other file, except now when I go to my terminal and I type in git status just to see where my repository is at. So like, oh no, there's some red text. It's not that scary. It just means that git has detected that there is a file in my project directory, in my working directory, in my hello world folder that I have changed, but is not currently in the staging area. So this means I have not told Git that they should do anything with this, but Git is just letting me know, the user, like, hey, you modified this file. You can use Git add to put it in the staging area. So we're going to take Git's advice and type Git add readme.md. And when we do that, nothing will happen. And that's good news again. So uh, this time when we type Git status, we'll be in the green, which says like, hey, you have some changes that are in the staging area and they need to be committed to in order to become the new version of our files. All right, so for the sake of this workflow, I'll show you how to commit it, but likely I will say like you can make more changes in a commit, you can make less changes in a commit. That is sort of up to personal preference. Just to show you, again, our local workflow of everything's in a project folder, then we add it to the staging area, then we commit to it and it becomes the new version of the file in our repository. Let's commit to it and make this the new version of the readme file in our repository. So we do that with the command git commit. We add the dash m for message. We will have to then write in quotes a commit message. A commit message is basically a signpost for yourself down the line to help you. I don't know if you've ever seen those GitHub repositories where you look uh, through the, the history of the repository and all it says is update code, update code, update code, update code. But um, that is less than desirable because I have no idea like if something breaks, what's a good signpost for me to take for that? So a good commit message is short, it's descriptive, uh, you know, past us can't answer emails about what we did to our code. So it's good for us to leave these signposts along the way. Typically commit messages start with a verb. So you'd say like in this commit, I add new info to the readme. Or you could say like add attribution or add acknowledgement in the readme. You can make it, uh, you can wordsmith it as much as you want, but this is good because it's short, sweet, it starts with a verb. When I hit enter, something will happen and that's good. You will have one, you will see that one file was changed, which is true, I just changed my readme file. I made seven insertions to that readme file and one deletion. So that's all we have to do. We just keep working and adding, committing, adding, committing, adding, committing, and that's, you don't have to do anything else except for the fact that we are in a collaboration. And this means that somebody else will want to see these changes that we're making on our local computer. If I go back to GitHub, you will see my readme file has not changed. So I have uh, material here on my local computer that is not on GitHub. So our local workflow, just to be clear, is you edit files as you normally would, work as you normally would from within the repository folder. When you are ready to make those changes, the new version of the files, you add them to the staging area, and then you commit to them with a good commit message that tells a little bit about what you did. 
you don't want to make like one commit for a day's worth of work because then you can't really find the differences. So if something breaks, it's a lot harder to go back and debug because you don't know when you added things. Typically coding is iterative. You start small, you add things on. So I like to make commits sort of thematically. Other people like to do like two commits before lunch, two commits after lunch. Um, people are variable, but I would really caution against doing like one big commit for a repository like once a day. I think that's way too, way too few. So we are working locally and now let's upload our changes to GitHub so that our collaborators can see them. So with Git, we push and it's literally the command git push origin, which is basically you can think of origin as a variable that holds a link to our repository. This is useful because sometimes you will want to have different remotes. Like if you fork someone's repository and you want to stay in sync with that fork, instead of origin, you would have you would have another one called upstream. So you can have as many of those variables as you want. But for our sake, origin is our one collaborative repository that we're working with. And then I push up my specific branch. So I say I want to push to origin my data viz ally branch. And when I click this, a lot of stuff will happen, which is very nice. It's uploading all the changes, but it also sees like, hey, you commit a pull request for this by visiting this link. If I hold down the control button while I click that link, it will open directly into the pull request interface. And this is a great way to work collaboratively by making a branch and pushing up a pull request. So you can do the same thing you would do in a uh, issue. You can say like, um, say like updated readme, that's the big, that's the big title. You notice here, like there's links that you can add specific snippets of code. You can add those check boxes. You can add people. Um, you can open it. You can quote other people. You can do everything. You can add an image to this. People add screenshots to their PRs. So you can be very detailed. Um, you can add labels to them. You can assign specific reviewers, although I generally advise against that uh, in collaborations just because you don't know what other people are doing. So when I click create pull request, you will see now I have one pull request and look, I can merge it because there are no conflicting changes. This might change if we had like seven pull requests. Maybe some you would be able to merge with that big green button here, which will just merge the data ally branch into our main branch and put my changes into the main repository. Uh, others you will encounter, you may encounter some issues, but you can always click this command line instructions and it will tell you how to go through and merge everything together. So it's really nice like that. A good rule of thumb is you don't merge in your own pull request. So if you're working in a collaboration, you work on a branch, you add commit, add commit, you push that branch to GitHub, you open a pull request, and then somebody else merges that in. And somebody else merges that in like A, so you can have a copy editor for your data, B, so that everyone in the project knows what's happening and who's doing what, and C, so you, again, avoid those merge conflicts of everyone pushing to main, you know, in a similar time frame, especially with a datathon, which is so short, you could have people pushing to main at the same time with the same file. So we don't want that to happen. So let's go through this branch and pull request workflow. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to click the merge button just to show you what it looks like. Although again, don't merge your own pull requests. Pretend I'm my collaborator doing this. It will automatically fill in a commit message saying you've merged in pull request two from this branch. And here is just the title of the uh, PR as the description. When I click confirm merge, you'll notice my pull request was closed. I have the option to delete the branch or not. If I'm going to be working more on this branch, I shouldn't delete it. If you're not going to be working more on this branch, you could delete it. It's fine. So now when I go back to my hello world code, like, yay, there's all my stuff from my pull request successfully in my main branch here. And you can see directly here, I merged in my own pull request. But again, it should be my collaborators. Now when I go back to my local computer, I can go back to main by using git checkout main. You can say like, hey, it says I'm up to date, but I know that I'm not actually, because I know that this code exists on the main branch here. But look, my, my readme automatically reloaded in my text editor when I switched back to my main branch. 
So clearly I have some changes that are on GitHub's main uh, branch that are not on my local main branch. So to be able to stay in sync when you have merged in pull requests, you go back to main with git checkout main, and then you just do git pull. And git pull will download all the changes and it will fast forward you in time so that now when I open my readme file, here's all of the stuff that I had just made a pull request about. So again, that workflow is you make a repository on GitHub, you give your collaborators access to that GitHub repository, you collaboratively write issues out for all your project work. When you're ready to start working on an issue, assign it to yourself. You would then clone your repository to your local computer, create a branch using Git, and then work as normal, adding and committing files as you work as they're ready to be checked into version control. You then would upload your work to GitHub via a pull request. And I would say too, these pull requests can be on draft mode if you're still working, so nobody merges it prematurely. That's just a button you click in GitHub's interface too. And then every so often you wanna make sure you also pull so that you stay in sync with your collaborators who are also making changes and hopefully merging things in. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit about how to use Git and GitHub for your collaborative project work. The very last thing I wanted to show you is the integration between GitHub Actions and Kaggle so that you can keep in sync uh, with, you can keep Kaggle in sync with your GitHub repository automatically. So we want to do all of our version control in GitHub, but we want our notebooks to exist on Kaggle too. So with this workflow, which you set up one time for your repository, you will be able to do all of your work in GitHub while still have it sync automatically to Kaggle. So let's look about how to do that. So here I am back in my GitHub repository, and you may notice this tab over here that says Actions. This is a new feature of GitHub that lets you uh, write computational workflows as plain text and have it affect your repository, which I think is really cool. Um, there are other systems that do this, like GitLab CI. You may have heard of Travis CI or Circle CI, Jenkins. There's a lot of them. This is GitHub's own in-house. So you can see they have some popular ones like deploy an app to Amazon ECS. But for us, we are going to uh, set up a workflow so that we can stay in, we can keep Kaggle in sync with our GitHub repository so our notebooks are in both places. So I click that set up a uh, workflow yourself. So when I do that, you'll see that it's uh, created a .github folder that is okay to touch too because this is gonna be versioned. We're gonna version our our actions uh, YAML file, our workflow. This is completely editable. You see GitHub did a nice job of pre-filling with certain things. But what's nice too is that we have this direct search in the right-hand side. So if I search Kaggle, I'm gonna click this Kaggle kernel actions. So this helps us push Jupyter Notebooks from GitHub to Kaggle and also helps us submit them when the time is ready, when the time is right. What's nice is I can click this full market listing and it will bring me to this nice uh, landing page that gives me some more information about how I can use this. So for instance, uh, here's the name and some potential usage. They go through all the different configurations. They can show you how to get an access key to uh, and all of the different action types that you can do like deploy them and things like that. So let's do that. So we can say push on main, pull on main. That makes sense. We're going to keep everything on main. It's going to run on Ubuntu latest. That's right. Um, however, we need a strategy. Ooh, here we go. We need a matrix of a key and value pair. So we can say something like Python version. And our first value could be 2. Uh, 7.18, whatever uh, value you're using for Python. For uh, hopefully everyone else, you're using something closer to 3.7 or 3.8. I'm just typing these in. But whatever, uh, whatever version of Python, just make sure you're putting it in there and what versions people are, are expected to be using. We can then hit enter. We don't want actually a new key value pair, so it auto-filled for us incorrectly. So we're just going to delete that. And in the same indentation line as our strategy, we're gonna say name, and we're actually gonna say Python. And we're gonna tell it to like, hey, look at our matrix dot 
Python version. So we're just going to say, pay attention to what we're using. Then we have the different steps. So we, now that we've set up like the container and we've set up our Python version, now we're going to go into the actual steps to be able to sync between Kaggle and GitHub. So here we're going to leave that in. We added our name and the uh, container that it's using here. So now we can say with. So these are all of our input parameters, the things that we will need. So what do we need to be able to push things to Kaggle? Well, I know that we need a Kaggle username because they won't just let anybody push to anywhere. Um, we're going to keep this in our secrets file. So you can just say secrets.kaggle username, and I'll show you how to add that after the fact. Oops. We also need our Kaggle key. And that's going to be a similar thing. We're going to keep it secret and keep it safe. So I'm going to use the Kaggle key there. We can say something like Kaggle make new kernel. So that is the command that is coming from Kaggle's actual API documentation to just uh, make a new notebook if there's one in our repository that doesn't exist on Kaggle. So we'll say true. We can say uh, the specific competition by putting in competition and then adding the name of it. So like Titanic is a common one. So that will like push it to the Titanic competition, for example. Uh, we have to tell GitHub Actions where to look for things. So we can say something like kernel ID. We're just gonna say that it is going to be our username and then the kernel slug. So that's like, I don't know, code.ipymb. Hopefully you're naming your things a little more descriptively than that. So like something like data analysis.ipymb would then become the slug. Uh, I'm gonna say the kernel type be, uh, is a notebook because remember we can have our markdown files. I'm gonna say the language is Python just to tell Kaggle, GitHub already knows about that, but now we'll tell Kaggle. We can say if it's private. So if you wanted to keep it private at first, you can by saying is private true. Uh, you can sub, uh, define a competition like we did before. So I can say Titanic again, but then you can say submit to competition. You can set that as false. So you can just change that to true whenever you're ready to submit. Uh, maybe that's like a big uh, thing at the end here. So this is one way to push our notebooks to Kaggle. So we have defined here our username and our key. So we can authenticate into Kaggle to be able to push things to it. We will say like, if there's a new notebook, then yeah, make it a new notebook, please. You can define the kernel ID. Uh, you don't have to, but you can. You can, uh, you should define the kernel type and language because again, GitHub knows that, but Kaggle doesn't. You can define if it's private or not. So you can set that to false. You can define the competition and when you want to submit to it. Um, and that should be all that you need to be able to automatically trigger your workflow to push notebooks from GitHub to Kaggle. There's only one more step necessary. So let's start this commit. We can say like initialize GitHub actions. I can commit it to strictly main or look, GitHub has a thing to commit a new branch and start a pull request. So I can say something like GitHub actions as my branch and propose the new file and make a pull request. So you can even do that on the web interface too. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna commit it to main, but you all should go through that pull request workflow as you're doing your collaborations. So when you say commit the new file, uh, this is actually not going to work right now because we haven't defined our secrets. So we haven't defined our username and our Kaggle key, but we can in our settings. Every GitHub repository has this little secrets tab down here. This is uh, encrypted, and, and but anyone with collaborator access can use these for actions. So it makes it nice to share these across different collaborators. So I can say new repository secret. It will tell me the secret name. So for us, it's going to be Kaggle username. Mine's just Vicky Steves. I can put it there. If you have an organization on Kaggle or a team name, you can put it there. I can hit add secret and it will show up like here. I can update it too and remove it if I need to. So I can just change the value there. And then you also do the same thing with the Kaggle key. And I'm going to paste in my key here. 
And you will see that I have two secrets here that I can now use with my GitHub Actions. So you can see here, this is most likely gonna fail. So I can just cancel the run. So you can always like go into here. It will always go for a commit. So you can see I stopped it prematurely. I can click this rerun all jobs. Now that my secret files are added, I can just go ahead and rerun it and see how it works. Uh, this also won't work because I don't have any Jupyter Notebooks in here, but I know now that when I add Jupyter Notebooks, they will be synced to Kaggle for me. So I hope that helps enhance your workflow and help automate some potentially annoying re-upload issues. So I hope this helps you work collaboratively in GitHub and then link those collaborations to your work in Kaggle.